Chapter 2, Database System Concepts and Architecture. In this chapter, we'll look at data models and their categories, a history of data models, schemas, instances, and states, the three schema architecture, data independence, DBMS languages and interfaces, database system utilities and tools, centralized and client server architectures, and a classification of database management systems. Previously, we talked about what a database is and what a database management system does. Today, we're going to introduce the concept of a data model. So a data model is a set of concepts used to describe the structure of a database, the operations for manipulating these structures, and certain constraints that the database should obey. In other words, what is the database composed of? What is it keeping track of? How do we query that information? and add to the database, remove things from the database, and what sort of business rules should the database reflect. The data model structure is defined by constructs. Constructs typically include elements with their data types, as well as groups of elements, so for example, an entity, record, and a table, and relationships among such groups. Constraints specify some restrictions on valid data that must be enforced at all times. So for example, consider entering a number of products in inventory. We should set a constraint such that the number of products can only be zero or greater. A data model also has operations that are used for specifying database retrievals and updates by referring to the constructs of the data model. So in other words, ways to get data and also update data that's inside the database. Operations on the data model may include basic model operations like a generic insert, delete, or update, and user-defined operations something like computing a student GPA or updating inventory. There are four different categories of data models. The conceptual data model is a high-level semantic data model that provides concepts that are close to the way many users perceive the data. Think of a house blueprint that doesn't have too much defining information specifically about that, what the house is going to be like. The physical data model is a low-level internal data model that isn't seen by users, that provides concepts that describe details of how data is stored in the computer. These are usually specified in an ad hoc manner through the DBMS design and administration manuals. The implementation data model, or representational data model, provides concepts that fall between the above two, used by many commercial DBMS implementations, for example, relational data models used in many commercial systems. This is the data model that we're going to focus on in our class next week. Finally, a self-describing data model combines the description of the data with the data values. Examples of these include XML, key store values, and some NoSQL systems. Let's talk about the difference between a schema and an instance. A database schema provides a description of a database. This includes descriptions of the database structure, data types, and constraints on the database. We're going to be working with these next week. A schema diagram is an illustrative display of most aspects of the database schema. A schema construct is a component of the schema or an object within the schema. For example, a student or course within the university mini world that we discussed in chapter one. Here's an example of a database schema. Notice that there aren't any pieces of data included simply just the skeleton structure of what each component or construct part of the schema is. This is our university mini world. We have a representation of a student, a course, a prerequisite, a section, and a grade report. Again, notice that there isn't any data included. We only have different attributes of each of what we'll call the entities here. So for example, for a student, we can see that the student has a name, a student number, a class, and a major. A course, we're interested in keeping track of data related to the course name, course number, credit hours, and department. The difference between a schema and an instance lies in that the instance provides actual data for the schema representation. This can be captured in what's referred to as a database state. A database state includes the actual data stored in a database at a particular moment in time. So if we were to go to a store, for example, and take a snapshot of what the inventory system looked like and what was currently available in products, we would see that current database state. 
This includes the collection of all the data in the database. It's also referred to as a database instance or occurrence or snapshot. The term instance is also applied to individual database components. For example, a record instance, a table instance, an entity instance. What we're going to see is that we're going to work with a lot of blueprints and have instances of those blueprints. For example, we have a blueprint of a student, of what that student might look like, and then we have specific students that are instances. A database state refers to the content of the database at a moment in time, and the initial database state refers to the database state when it is initially loaded into the system. The initial database state does not necessarily have to have no data. A valid database state is a state that satisfies the structure and constraints of the database. So for example, we couldn't have, say, a car necessarily stored in a university system if it wasn't being kept track of. Let's take a look at an example of a database state. Notice that here we have actual instances of each entity. In other words, we have data. If we take a look at the course table, we can see that we have still the schema, the course name, the course number, the credit hours in the department, but we also have specific instances of each course. For example, we have data about an intro to computer science course, data structures course, discrete mathematics course, and a database course. When we're communicating about the representation of data in a database, we often talk about a three schema architecture. While the three schema architecture is not explicitly used in commercial DBMS products, it has been useful in explaining database system organization. It's been proposed to support DBMS characteristics of what's called program data independence and support of multiple views of the data. The three schema architecture defines DBMS schemas at three different levels. First, the internal schema defines what the schema looks like at the internal level to describe physical storage structures and access paths. This typically uses a physical data model. This is going to be specific to how it's actually stored in the database. The conceptual schema is a schema at the conceptual level to describe the structure and constraints for the whole database for a community of users. This type of schema is the one that we're going to spend the most time on. It uses a conceptual or an implementation data model. An external schema is a schema at the external level used to describe the various user views. These usually use the same data model as the conceptual schema. Here we have a representation of how the different layers of the schema work together. You can see that the end users are seeing the external view of the schema. On the internal level, we have the internal schema, and the conceptual schema provides a connection between the two. Think of again the example of a house blueprint. As a person designing a floor plan, you don't necessarily need to know what materials the floor is going to be made of. So a house floor plan blueprint might be found at the conceptual level or even at the external level. The builder of the house, however, needs to know the materials and exactly how things are going to be laid out. This sort of information is what will be provided at the internal level. Mappings are required among the schema levels to transform requests and data. Programs refer to an external schema, which the users see, and are mapped by the DBMS to the internal schema for execution. Data extracted from the internal DBMS level is reformatted to match the user's external view. For example, formatting the results of a SQL query for display in a web page. We'll see how this works as the class progresses. One of the most important reasons for having these different schemas is to preserve what's called data independence. We think of two different types of data independence. Logical data independence, which is the ability to change the conceptual schema without having to change the external schemas and their associated application programs. In other words, we can change some information in the conceptual schema that's related to our mini world without having to change how the application programs access the data. Physical data independence is the ability to change the internal schema on the bottom without having to change the conceptual schema. In other words, think of again the house blueprint. We can change to say building with brick instead of wood and not change the overall dimensions of the house. The internal schema may be changed when certain file structures are reorganized or new indexes are created to improve database performance. This doesn't mean that we go ahead and change what the mini world looks like. When a schema at a lower level is changed, only the mappings between this schema and higher level schemas need to be changed in a DBMS that fully supports data independence. The higher level schemas themselves are unchanged. Hence, the application programs need not be changed since they refer to the external schemas. Let's talk about how we can communicate with the database. 
In order to define what's in the database, we use a data definition language, or DDL. This language includes procedures like adding and dropping tables from the database. We also use a data manipulation language, or DML, to communicate with the database. These are high-level or non-procedural languages that include the relational language, SQL, or SQL. These can be used in a standalone way or maybe embedded in a programming language like Python or Java. There are also low-level or procedural languages that have to be embedded in a programming language. The data manipulation language, like SQL, is the one that's used to conduct queries to retrieve information from the database. Let's take a closer look at what a data definition language does. A data definition language is used by the database administrator and database designers to specify the conceptual schema of the database. In many DBMSs, the DDL is also used to define internal and external schemas or views. If we consider the mini world of the university, the database administrator and designers would use the data definition language in order to create the student table, the prerequisite table, and the course table. In some database management systems, separate storage definition language and view definition language are used to define internal and external schemas. A storage definition language is typically realized by a DBMS commands provided to the administrator and database designers. Data manipulation languages like SQL are used to specify database retrievals and updates. DML commands, data sublanguage, can be embedded in a general purpose programming language like COBOL, C, C++, or Java. A library of functions can also be provided to access the DBMS from a programming language. Alternatively, standalone DML commands can be applied directly in a query language. There are different types of data manipulation languages. There are high-level or non-procedural languages, for example, the SQL relational language. These are set-oriented and specify what data to retrieve rather than how to retrieve it. These are also called declarative languages. There are also low-level or procedural data manipulation languages. These retrieve data one record at a time. Constructs such as looping are needed to retrieve multiple records, along with positioning pointers. What kinds of interfaces exist to communicate with the database using a database management system? There are standalone query language interfaces, for example, using SQL queries at the DBMS Interactive SQL interface. We will conduct SQL queries in this way later in the course. There are also programmer interfaces for embedding data manipulation language in programming languages. Some interfaces are quite user-friendly, like Microsoft Access or SQLite. These are often menu-based, forms-based, or graphics-based. There are also mobile interfaces that allow users to perform transactions using mobile apps. In addition to being able to communicate with data using the database management system, we also need several database system utilities. We need these utilities to perform certain functions like loading data stored in files into a database. This includes data conversion tools. We need utilities to back up the database periodically. This is very important because we don't want to lose our data. Utilities can also be used to reorganize database file structure, monitor performance, generate reports, and other functions like sorting, user monitoring, or data compression. Additional tools include data dictionaries and repositories. These are used to store schema descriptions and other information such as design decisions, application program descriptions, user information, and usage standards. The active data dictionary is accessed by the database management system software and users or administrator. The passive data dictionary is accessed only by users and the database administrator. Here is a visual representation of how different types of users communicate with the stored database. On the lower level, you can see the components of the database and the systems that are used to communicate with it on a low level. In the upper part of the diagram, you can see the different types of users that connect to the database through the database management system. We just finished discussing the data definition language and the data manipulation language that can be used to communicate with the database. In this diagram, you can see that the database administrative staff can use both the data definition language and privileged commands to communicate with the database. They use the data definition language to do things like add tables to the database by way of the system catalog and data dictionary. The casual users of the database that need to pull information from it will do so using interactive queries. The application programmers will use the data manipulation language through applications to communicate with the database. And the parametric users that we discussed, those that only need to access information from the database every once in a while, can do so using a collection of compiled transactions.
Let's talk about what it means when a DBMS architecture is centralized and the different styles of client-server architecture. In a centralized database, everything is combined into a single system, including the DBMS software, hardware, application programs, and user interface processing software. The user can still connect through a remote terminal, but all the processing is done at a centralized site. Here is an overview of what a physical centralized architecture might look like. Here, users can connect directly to the DBMS through the network. The basic two-tier client-server architecture has different servers that have specialized functions. For example, a printing server, a file server, a web server, an email server, and finally, a DBMS server. Clients can access the specialized servers as needed. Here's a logical representation of two-tier client-server architecture. We have a network, and clients use the network to connect to each specialized server directly. Clients provide appropriate interfaces through a client software module to access and utilize the various server resources. Clients may be diskless machines or PCs or workstations with disks with only the client software installed. Clients are connected to servers via some sort of network. The database management system server provides database query and transaction services to the clients. Relational DBMS servers are often called SQL servers, query servers, or transaction servers. We will be connecting to one of these in our course. Applications running on clients use an application program interface or API to access server databases by a standard interface, such as ODBC or JDBC. In the two-tier client-server architecture, the client and the server must install appropriate client modules and server module software for the ODBC or the JDBC. The client program may connect to several database management systems, sometimes called the data sources. In general, data sources can be files or other non-DBMS software that manages data. In a three-tier client-server architecture, we have an intermediate layer called an application server or web server. The intermediate layer stores the web connectivity software and the business logic part of the application used to access the corresponding data from the database server. This intermediate layer acts like a conduit for sending partially processed data between the database server and the client. One of the advantages of using a three-tier architecture is that it can enhance security. The database server is only accessible via the middle tier. Clients cannot directly access the database server. The client is typically a PC or a mobile device connected to the web. Here we see a logical representation of the three-tier client-server architecture with the intermediate layer. The client uses a web interface to connect to the middle layer, which then communicates with the database server. Database management systems can fall under different categories of classification. We can classify a DBMS based on the data model that it uses. For example, a legacy model like the network or hierarchical model, a model that's in current use like the relational model, object-oriented model, or object-relational model, or more recent models. We can also talk about a DBMS in terms of how many users it has. DBMSs can also be classified as centralized or distributed. In other words, is the database and the applications that connect to it in one location or are they distributed on multiple computers using multiple databases? Distributed database management systems have now come to be known as client-server-based database systems because they don't support a totally distributed environment, but rather a set of database servers that support a set of clients. What are the cost considerations for choosing a database management system? Database management systems range from free open source systems to configurations costing millions of dollars. There are many free relational database management systems, like MySQL, that we're going to use in this course. One of the advantages of using a commercial database management system is that it might offer additional specialized modules. These offer additional specialized functionality when purchased separately and are sometimes called cartridges or blades. There are typically different licensing options for these commercial database management systems, including site licenses, max concurrent user licenses, or single user licenses. In the next lesson, we'll review a history of data models before introducing the relational data model that we'll use for the rest of the course.